Test automation has very little meaning if you can't easily control the world as the test case sees. Fortunately, our test case lives in the matrix. It wants to connect to various other systems, but with some setup, we can trick it into seeing only what we want. To help keep this video shorter, I've separated the installation of Mach to another video, linked in the description. Now we will progress through a series of testing evolutions to establish different potential solutions, challenges they may face, and how to resolve them until we reach a highly effective pattern. The seven test cases are all available on github.com and the link is in the description. Our complex system is pretty small. It has a reference to video system and on start it plays a video. So our test cases will attempt to validate that when it starts that the video started playing. The first test case is marked to ignore because it will fail. Here we create a game object and then add the component complex system to it. With the yield return null, we trigger the start function, but it crashes here because the test case is not as simple as just loading the one object. In this test case, we must load all the objects this class depends on recursively. So in the second version of this test, which will also fail, we also load the video system and hook it up. It's the same test, but even though we hooked up the video system, it still crashes on a null reference. Why? Well, let's take a look at video system. This is already bad. We shouldn't need to look into the code of supporting classes in order to determine how to write a test case that validates this one. Here's the issue. Video system, for some reason, can't be used until it's initialized, and it doesn't initialize until start. So both the video system and complex system initialized during start, and we got caught up in a race condition. Since the test case added complex system first, video system was not initialized when it was called, and so the play command never actually fired. Test case 3 represents our first working example. The only real change here is that we created the video system before the complex system. So start functions also executed in that order. Please don't expect this to always be the case. Multiple things can cause the sequence order to change. This is a serious red flag and makes your system highly susceptible to race conditions and it will be very difficult to change this later. We will address that red flag with observable locator on the last two test cases. For the next three test cases, I've created an implementation of iVideo system called underscore four underscore video system. It has no initialization in it. It's just there to simplify the test case and mock the interface. Without initialization, play will always set the is playing to true. Please note, I'm using the word mock in the general form. Later, we will introduce the mock or MOQ framework to properly mock this. But because we've removed the complexities of the video system, we can effectively test the complex system in isolation. We're still failing to capture an initialization sequencing risk because it's not really addressed yet. We will, but this test case works. I should also call out that we are no longer using complex system, but have moved on to complex system two. There will be two more evolutions in complex system after this. But in order to use interfaces in the test case, the code has to support interfaces. We still have video system directly, but it's private and using serialized field. This means that underscore video will not be visible outside this class, but the Unity IDE can still see it. In addition to that, we are also storing a reference to the interface version with the same name but Pascal case. And finally, a property that exposes the video system, making it testable and replaceable called video. The getter just returns the interface reference. The setter checks to see if the value being set is the class type that the IDE will be able to show, and if so, sets it. Whatever it received, it will set the interface reference with it. OnValidate is pulled in because if we change the value at runtime in the editor, the interface reference wouldn't have been updated, so we make sure it does. Finally, when the start function executes and we first attempt to use this, the interface may never have been set. Since interface fields don't serialize, we are 100% responsible for establishing their values. Okay, so now our class has three different video reference fields. This feels complicated to maintain, and quite frankly, that would be. 
especially when testing a larger number of classes and you may need to produce a large number of test cases to verify all the functionality. Proper MLQ mocking will work better, but before then, let's take a look at another evolution first. Test 5 is effectively the same as the previous, except this one uses Complex System 3. This class initially looks simpler, except that the video field is this weird generic thing. In the previous version, there was a lot of things to do to expose a class to the IDE and interface to the external scope, and the internal scope was then left with three potential targets for the programmer to have to figure out. This at least gets rid of the complexity of defining all that at runtime, and also giving the programmer only one target. This weird generic field is not too complicated. It holds two generic types, T being the class type and I being the interface type. Technically abstract type, not interface, but close enough. So we store both values with the class type being exposed only to the IDE and the interface reference private, and then the getter will grab whichever has the value or return null. The setter can clear things out if need be, but also set the interface value, nullifying the class value. So the getter always returns the interface if it has one. The code and test is effectively the same as last, but at least in the classes, you can simulate the structure with a smaller code base. While this uses more inspector wizardry, of course there is much more out there, we're not really making our code easier to understand. We also can't just say video.play, but now we must use video.value.play. Not a big deal, but still a regular requirement to reach out another scope level. So, in test 6, we are evaluating the use of an observable locator to get rid of dependencies without needing an overly complex system. We start by generating the same underscore four underscore video system class instance, but this time we are using locator.set iVideo system to announce it. Let's see complex system 4 to see how this is different. So it's slightly larger than the first one, but in this one, we only have the reference to the interface. We don't even bother with class type anymore. Then in the constructor, yes, the constructor, we begin observing iVideo system. That means the moment someone announces it, we can use it. Since we are only calling .play and not requiring any references set in deserialization, even if iVideo system becomes available before awake, we can safely call it. Technically, we could even not store the video reference and get rid of the start function and call object.play when the video system is announced. If I'm not worried about any of these systems going away, then I could even do this whole thing in one small line from the constructor. Observable locator is built on a system of trust that a system won't announce itself until it's ready to take commands. So in our test case, we set the locator then create the complex system and progress frames. It works, but we're still using hard-coded classes to evaluate this. For small things, it's not a, such a big deal, but this does expand quickly. So in test seven, our last test, we take advantage of MOQ. Here, we no longer reference the hard-coded video system class, but instead call on the mock system to generate one for us. The basic type starts with generic mock object where T is I video system. From there, we set up the play command. So with mock objects, the methods and properties will return default values and voids just returns null, or just return. No errors, no exceptions, but when we set up a command, we are basically calling on the object and then telling it to alter that default behavior. In our case, when play is called, we execute a function that increments the actual value. Actual in this case means how many times was the play function called. Now the mock object has a constructed interface instance you can get from dot object, which is now what we pass into locator. And the rest of the test case is the same. While this complex case was actually fairly simple, all too often, bad coding practices lead to large quantities of tightly coupled code, especially when that leads back to various game manager or game.cs, or other black hole classes that grow in complexity and state, especially by way of direct references. Suddenly, the replacement of your class means you need to mock 50% of your entire code base for a single test. That's just not feasible. 
So from walking through this experience, I'm hoping you've gained a valuable insight to how complex code can become and where to draw the line. You don't need to do this a lot to get the idea. But also, even if you are just a tester, identifying untestable regions are a point to call out to the developers to fix and even provide them with the tools if need be. I'm also hoping you see the value in observable locator and strong test cases, as quite honestly, maintaining this as a regular practice for the application's primary logic and architecture is highly valuable to keep projects stable long term.